So as you guys know, we're here for the counseling um, uh, session. Not counseling per se in a session per se, but counseling in the introduction. So in this uh, little presentation, I'm going to go through my own understanding. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, everybody know who I am? Do you know my background? No. Let me just tell you this before we begin. Uh, the reason uh, I'm going to present to you guys with this is because this has been something that's been in the back of my heart and my mind. As we've seen from many of the other speakers today, their talents in speaking about the theology of our church. But this is the outreach of our church that um, has caught my heart. And I have studied both uh, my master's in counseling and the my undergrad in psychology, so I'm always interested in people. And in theology, we also try to understand people. But my heart and my uh, ministry has now been focused on this. And uh, my life is also an experience, which I will tell you guys a little bit about, too, when we go through some of these questions. And even before I begin, I just want to say, I'm just not a therapist. Don't think of me as a therapist, but think of me as a moderator teaching you guys this. And also, one other thing is, I'm not just a mo uh, moderator. But I'm also a client. You guys understand what I mean? The reason why I believe in this is because I went through this. And this is something our church needs very much. And so this is basically going to be an intro for you guys to experience counseling in a way that you have. I know a lot of you guys have doubts about counseling as well. So <clears throat> let me ask you guys this. What is counseling to you guys? What have you heard about counseling? Anything? What comes to mind? Does anything come to mind at all? Giving advice. Giving advice? Help? What's a typical or stereotype that may come to mind when you hear about counsel? Shrink. Shrink. Very good. Listening. Crazy people. Listening. Thank you. Listening. And, huh? Listening. Listening. Very good. One of the positives, yeah. Um, especially coming from our culture, what do we hear when we hear counsel? Huh? Advice, yeah, talk about advice. But you guys also hear crazy or think you walked into that, right? We hear that a lot, right? And part of the problem is because we ourselves don't understand what counseling is in the correct mindset. So going to counseling does not mean that we are crazy. You guys understand that? So we have to kind of let go of these stereotypes that we have because it doesn't mean that you're stupid, it doesn't mean you're crazy, it doesn't mean that you're lazy. What it means is that what counseling does is it has a way of bringing out problems. And in our uh, culture, and especially in our society, what do we do when there's problems? Who do we turn to? Hmm? Friends. Friends, right? Most likely friends. Or some of us, what, what do we do generally? We go into our rooms and we right. cry about it. <laughs> That's okay. Take it like a man, right? <laughs> <laughs> Women too. But no, we ultimately go away from the problem, right? We kind of run into our own self-centeredness by going into a place that we feel comfortable, right? Which is our friends, our family sometimes. And the problem is when it comes to counseling, we have to identify a problem. And I think that's where a lot of issue comes from. And I know a lot of us here have been through confession too, right? And part of the reason why we don't go for confession is because we don't want to admit that something is wrong with us. Remember? You had a uh, presentation yesterday. What? Are we perfect? Everyone sitting here, even myself, we're not perfect, are we? And we need to also be cleansed of this in a sense. And not, this is not saying that we don't need confession in the church. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is with confession, there comes a need for our people. A need that a lot of us forget about because when it comes to counseling itself, we hear all these negative things. But ultimately what counseling does is, you know, the stuff that we do in the confession, now we have to resolve those issues. Because confession brings out the spiritual aspect. And we all know that we're, we're made of three parts, right? I like to say this, which might be heretical in some teaching, but this is the psychological way of, way of thinking. We make ourselves up of what? Our physical being, right? Which is what? What? Body, right? And then we have our what? Minds. Minds. We'll come on that. And the third? 
soul, which is also our spirituality. So let's go back to the mind. Now what's wrong with the mind? What's, what's so important about the mind? You go there, that direction. Sometimes it plays tricks. Plays tricks, very good. Plays tricks on us. Um, I'll bring that up if we have time at the end. Uh, what else? Here, when I speak or if someone else speaks, do we ever, can two people ever explain things the same way? No, right? If I tell you to express your life from your childhood to now, would any one of you guys have the same similar thing? No, right? You guys go through your own trials and tribulations and problems, right? And counseling, what it helps is with that aspect, the mind aspect, because unfortunately, like we mentioned, the mind can play tricks on us. And there's a spiritual walk, and there's also the mental walk, where we need to be cleansed and also be changed, in a sense, to open up our hearts and our minds uh, in front of someone who is not just a spiritual counselor, but someone who is a neutral person. And uh, fortunately enough, you guys have been through my premarital counseling sessions. So uh, I can kind of go into some of the stuff that we talk about there is that when, when, there, when there's problems, we usually go to our families, right? Someone that, our friends. But that's not the resolution. We, go, we should go to a person that has no connection with us. Someone who is not involved with us. Because that's the only way that you're gonna get both perspectives, right? Not just our own personal perspective, but also the perspective of someone else. So that's another thing that counseling brings now. And then unfortunately, don't believe in the stereotypes, like our friends, like our family, telling you that counseling is something bad. And then you only have to go to counseling when there's something wrong, you know? Uh, how many of us go for a regular physical checkups? The majority of us, right? You have to, right? Just to make sure everything is okay. The same thing with counseling, it's not just when problems occur, but also, we also want to make sure during the process to make sure you get yourself checked out as well. So any questions? So I'm going to go through some myths that people and other individuals have talked about counseling, okay? Most common myths, okay? We'll just go through all, we'll go through uh, one by one right now, and then we'll go through more in depth. People cannot change. This is something that's common. Um, we always have this idea. And then number two, it's too late to address my issues, all right? And I must have uh, severe problems to see a counselor. And if I go see a counselor, my chances of uh, obtaining a certain job will be uh, hindered. People have said this. These are questions and concerns that people have. I'm the only one who feels the way I do, all right? And there's more. <clears throat> My problems are too small, too big, for my counselor to help me. My family problems don't affect me. Right? We heard this a lot. And then, this is a very touchy subject, because no one ever wants to admit this part. My mental health has not, nothing to do with my academic problems. Right? And also the next one. My mental health has nothing to do with my friendship, my relationship, and my social skills. And then, counselors fix problems. All of these are myths that we're going to kind of go into. And I'm pretty sure some of you guys have had some of these doubts too, right? I had it too, so that's why we're here. We're going to go through some of these together. Okay. How many of you guys have heard this one? People can't change. You guys believe this? You don't believe it, right? But I know family, I know friends that come up to me and said, you're never going to change uh, someone. What's the old saying in English? You can't teach a dog new tricks, right? And I'm going to throw my own personal uh, opinion on this. My dad, who is very traditional Orthodox, right? Uh, he is one of those stubborn, uh, nice <laughs> individuals, right? Um, <laughs> where uh, I cannot change anything that he says, right? But I realized after I turned a certain age and I got married, you know, once we leave the house, uh, you notice a little change in him. It's not, I'm not saying it would be a drastic change in everyone, but it happens to the point where he himself changed in a way. Uh, 
he, my dad's very old school, and many of you who have grown up with me kind of know uh, he always wanted church before anything else. And I would tend to be the perfect family, which that was never the case either. But as I got married and had my first child, I see a change in him. Now it's almost like he is taking my grandfather role from a different perspective. And now, it's, before it's what? Do what I say, right? Now it's more like, oh wait, since you're married, there's two people that he has to ask and do things about. So everyone is always capable of change. But unfortunately, this goes the wrong way, especially for young women. Sorry if you're coming. But when you guys go into a relationship, what happens? This happens a lot. You think you can? Change. Change the first thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> Unfortunately, this is a stereotype again, but this is not the case. The person that you can change is who? Yourself. Exactly. So this is part of that process. And, um, and it's, the change can be small, big, whatever it is, but it has to start from where? within yourself. And that's where the issues and problems occur a lot. Make sense? So one myth kind of semi-interested, right? How about this one? Uh, I'm guilty of this. I had to wait till I was, let's see, 25 to address my life problems. Um, but you've heard this, right? It's too late to address my issues. Do you, I mean, you guys believe that or you heard that? It's kind of a process that we go through, right? Um, and it's never too late, because to be honest with you, uh, I used to work for Child Protective Services, you guys know what that is. Um, we used to talk to kids uh, starting at the age, even newborns, but not talking to them in, in the way of communication, but talking to them through play therapy, through different uh, other kind of resources, like interactions with them, with friends and group activities. And you see this happening even from a young age, that people need therapy from a very young age. And it, it's amazing how these young kids, through interactions, for example, we had this young girl come to our session, right? And she's playing with a Barbie doll. And uh, there's a Ken doll and a Barbie doll. We both know what all that is, right? Well, she's playing with both these dolls, and uh, shows what kind of family she comes from. The Ken doll is hitting the Barbie doll. And we know where this is coming from, right? She was, she didn't read this in a novel. Didn't see this on TV. This is happening where? In home. So this starts from an old, uh, early age and it continues on. If there's no resolution, it continues on until uh, you're old. But we've also had individuals who work in there like, 70s and 80s and uh, go through therapy and they're just like having an epiphany. They have a change in their life, they're like, you know what, I wish I did this a long time ago. So this is, a, I mean, this is something for you guys to just think about because it can be effective at any age. It doesn't matter if you're small. Because you see this in our kids sometimes. In our kids, we see a lot of this uh, sadness, problems, and we don't know what to do. As, as a parent for myself, speaking from my own personal experience, it's like, it's very, very, I mean, I'm, I'm worried about what's going to happen to survive. And one thing is I would always open up the doorway for her to do something like that. Is there any questions? We'll, we'll save some questions for the end, how's that? Okay, how about this one? We hear this a lot, too. And this is something that I know, uh, severe problems. There's so many ways to describe severe problems, right? And unfortunately, it's not true. We're not crazy, we're not wacko. And unfortunately, every situation that we go through, because all of us have their own trials and tribulations, right, that you're facing. And it seems like at a point, you don't know what to do, you know? You try everything that you're used to. You go to your comfort zones, right? Go to your family, go to your friends. And are we getting any help there? Sometimes we do, right? We think we feel okay. But the problem is, when you go to those, you don't ever get resolution. Because you're only listening to one perspective. 
So counseling gives you the opportunity to see a new perspective and work with that perspective to find a way to cope with that problem and find resolution. And that's part of the thing that counseling does is get resolution in the end. And this is something that we can, we want to say that we only have problems. No. It's always good to always check up even after a problem. And each counselor is so talented in different uh, perspectives. There's counselors for um, especially young youth adolescents. There's counselors for adults, adolescent, uh, older teenage uh, counselors, as well as those for problems like stress. We all go through stress, right? And then depression, there's counselors for depression. And there's also counselors for grief, when people die, when things happen, all these other drastic things. And at those times, it's good to see the counselor too. At the same time, there's also counselors for marriage counseling. And there's something that our culture is like completely against. Because you don't talk about your problems, right? When there's, especially with marriage. And I remember sort of the presentation, we don't talk about it. We just keep it under cover. And when you do that, what happens? What happens with the relationship? It builds up to the point where what? There's yelling, there's screaming, and sometimes leads to physical abuse. So that's another uh, subject that we'll talk about next. So any questions? Go on. All right. I heard this because uh, I'll tweak this up a little bit more for you guys as well, too. Um, have you guys heard about this one? Like, obtaining jobs? It's true to a certain perspective. Um, let me show you an example of this. Confidentiality, like, uh, Everything that you tell a counselor, you sign a paper, you sign a verbal agreement uh, with, especially if you come from here, you always have this verbal agreement that any information that you get, it's only going to stay within the session. And when we get more professional in this, we're going to have documentation. Because what happens is this information is private. But how many of you guys are in the health profession? Any nurse doctors? Any nurses? You guys are mandatory reporters, right? Right? Counselors are also the same thing. You guys know what that means? Mandatory reporting? Have you guys heard of that? What is it? Child abuse. Child abuse. 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 What else? No, I said you're a mandatory. Elderly abuse. Elderly abuse. Life threatening. Life threatening, exactly. Uh, again, this is where this information may go astray. Being a mandatory reporter means if there's child abuse, and this is something that uh, I think our church needs to be more adamant about, because there's a lot of child abuse going on that needs to be reported, because no one's paying the price for this problem. The second one is also, um, if you're ever gonna threaten somebody, if you're gonna kill somebody, as a mandatory reporter, uh, the counselor has to give that information out. And then finally, if you're suicidal, if you're gonna hurt yourself, because this is where I think a lot of people get confused about. Because in therapy and also in the church itself when it comes to uh, confession, there's a limitation where we need to be more effective in our ministry, which is this outreach, which is helping people in need of crisis. Because I remember when I was in seminary, uh, there was a study that they did um, about a young man who went in for confession. And this young man told his was a preacher, it wasn't in the Orthodox Church, but the preacher, that he wanted to commit suicide. And you know what the preacher told him? What do we hear a lot? Pray. Pray about it. Things will be done. You know what happened? He killed himself the next day. So there's so much things that are going on where we need to be adamant about. Because if you don't report it right away, who knows what's going to happen? So that's part of what counseling does. This is the information that gets taken out. We can't keep those information private when it comes to those matters. Make sense? So it doesn't mean that the counselor's going to go to your boss, go to your friends, even go to your spouse. This is something that you guys have to understand. When it comes to uh, marriage counseling, the, the sessions that I do usually, I do it individually. It means that the husband and wife are separate. And what the husband or the wife says, you don't tell each other unless they're in the same room. Make sense? So they won't ever get that information. So you can say all the 
things you want to say about your wife. <laughs> All the things you want to say about your husband. But in the end, if things need to be exchanged, things will be exchanged. All right? All right. Um, oh, I feel like this all the time. <laughs> you guys feel this? Yeah? I am the only one who feels this way. You know? We all go through these things in our life, right? You know, these, everyone's got this special thing about their own life. Everyone's uh, walk with God and walk in life is so different. Like I mentioned before, everyone's path is so different. And there's so, little, there's so many like roller coaster rides, right? Valleys, hills, all these other things that oftentimes just like, what's normality? You know, what's normal in life? There's really nothing that's normal. And if you try to live a life like your friends, can you ever live that same life? And I always tell my couples that I meet with, uh, do you ever compare your, your marriage with someone else? Do you compare your friend's life with your life? Do you guys do that? I did that growing up. My parents did that to me. They'll be like, oh, why can't you be like so-and-so's son? Why can't you be smart like him? Why can't you do this? I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> what that does is also bring more doubt in your mind about yourself. Yourself is being beaten down to the point where you don't know who you are and who these other, these other people are really good at what they do too. Not saying that that's bad. But the thing is, our own individual self is what we need to think about. Yeah, we may think we're feeling this, but the counselor um, can have a way of providing um, something that make yourself uh, be brought out more. And there doesn't have to be a normality. Normality is just one of those things that we just uh, stereotype again. So, what you deal with is something that you have to deal with for your own growth. So we kind of build up on that, right? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. My problems are too big, too small uh, for the counselor to help me. You know, uh, there isn't one thing I, I haven't heard about. You know, being a priesthood, I've had some taste of this, but working in the field that I work, I've heard everything and anything under the sun. And uh, experience distress, how big or small, you know, when we have a good counselor, they can guide you through those problems. And unfortunately, when we're sitting here, we think our problems are bigger than our brothers and our sisters, right? But we don't know. And that's part of the thing. It's not to know what our brothers and our sisters are doing, but for us to get away from feeling that. Because unfortunately when it comes to, even with the confession, I feel this too, a lot of us want to hold on to that, you know? And I think with counseling, we can have a way of escaping these thoughts, these things that we're coming constantly over and over again, that brings us down to the point where we feel so low, we feel so beaten up, and there's nothing that I can do, you know? But there is something you can do. You can provide a way by going to a counselor, and I'm not saying every counselor is going to help. Don't, I'm not saying that. Uh, the thing I'm trying to say is when you find a good counselor, that's the thing. You have to find someone who can help you and guide you through this. And my children are probably going to hate me for saying this. And it's not our priest. Unfortunately, it's not our priest. I say that. Um, speaking from my own experience of my own uh, dealing with this, that there's always an outlet. And we have to find that outlet. When Big or small, we have to find it. So this is what the counseling aspect does for us. Got it? Oh, have you guys felt this? Any of you guys made of stone? We're made from mud, right? Is it there? <laughs> Close enough. We mentioned we were in three parts, right? Physical, and emotional, and spiritual, right? And even with those three, that connection is there. There's not this immunity from problems around us. There's always problems within our community, within our physical bodies. There's all these other things. And uh, someone who says that there's no problems, you know, there's a lot of addiction in our family. There's abuse in our family. Uh, both 
mental, emotional, physical, sexual. And there's mental illness. You know, when mental illness is not taken care of, um, I know a lot of examples. I can go through every person I've ever met that had mental illness. And I used to work at a psychiatric hospital too for volunteer hours. And the people that go there are just like you and me. All it takes is one small little incident to make this thing completely go out of whack. Not saying that you guys are out of whack or anything. No, but the point is, when it does go out of whack, we need to bring it back into a way that it can help us and be effective towards ourselves. And then, this is something that's happening a lot in our community, divorce. You know, we don't talk about it. A lot of the stuff, when it comes to counseling, we don't talk about it. We try to hide as much as possible. And this is where more of the problems build up. More problems, more confusion, and more misunderstandings about ourselves and who we are. Because this can happen to anybody. All right? All right. This is a tough one, right? How many of us really, really, would ever have admit to this, right? Um, Mental health, not meaning that, uh, let's not go to the, full, uh, the other spectrum of schizophrenia, but I'm talking about like depression. I'm talking about uh, difficulties with other things like substance abuse and other things like that. Mental health is kind of, unfortunately, it's given a very negative stereotype. And when some mention mental health, what does everyone always think of? Crazy, Crazy right? And if you go, if you guys ever had the opportunity of going into uh, an institute for mental mentally health, um, it's changed a lot within the past ten years. But before, they used to put people that were schizophrenic with depressed people, and that is not good. That doesn't resolve the problem. You know what happens to people when they're put into that situation? That's when more they kind of pick up some of these attributes that the other people have too. And then this is where. This is a problem if you mental health like depression is not taken care of, you know what it can become? Bipolar disorder, person personality disorder, anxiety disorder, stuff like that. So um, this is in my personal life. Uh, I've had I've come to the point where I've almost failed out of college because of personal things that have happened in my own life. And to be honest with you, a lot, a lot of our brothers and our sisters exact same thing. You know, they're going through college. High school was a breed, right? But then when you get to college, it's a different standard. And you have the freedom to do a lot of things. And there's a lot of individuals that fall and burn through college. And part of that problem is there's some underlying problem that's not being resolved. And part of that is it might they might need to see somebody. And because a college and school is very demanding and it's going to take a lot out of that person so and as this even says up to a third of all graduate students graduate students here um, are coping with mental health problems that's the majority of us right you don't have to admit anything right now <laughs> this is just a study that was done all right my mental health has nothing to do with my friendship, relationship, and social skills. Do you guys agree with that? No, okay. It has everything to do with my mental health, right? Um, you know, like I mentioned about the young child with the two dolls, right? Beating each other up. You know, that child, if she wasn't receiving counseling, you know, she would end up in an abusive relationship. The likelihood of uh, going into uh, an abusive relationship starts from our uh, youth. So young kids who see it continue to do it. Or they go into a relationship because they find the same characteristics, because their mom or their dad had that same characteristic the other person has. And same for sons too. They end up being the abuser because what? They've been taught that way from growing up. And I'd say that our, our, our family is not perfect either, right? Some of us come from difficult problems in our family, and we pretend like there's nothing wrong with our families, right? And our church also teaches us this, that 
You know, the family that comes to church first, the ones that are the pillar orthodox faithful at home, what is there? There's nothing there. There's no relationship. The husband and wife, it becomes more of an arrangement. It's like a business arrangement. I'm the wife, I'm the husband. We make money, and the kids grow up. And there's no connection. And this is where some people believe that there is no connection, but there is. Because of that role, that uh, children will also kind of fall back into that uh, mindset as well. And we're, I mean, our church is guilty of this too, so we have to find a way of clarifying this to bring a change. A change in a way that we can get away from what we think a good family should be, but live with the family that we have. Find the problems, work through the problems, and in the end, find, I'm going to repeat this over and over again, resolution. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Counselors fix problems. This is, I think, the most, uh, I think, the myth that everyone has that if I come for counseling, the counselor can fix me. You know? And unfortunately, it's not going to be as easy. Because unfortunately, how old are we? Don't say that loud. But we have many years in our life. And every day we have interactions. Every day we've had some kind of problem, issues, and concerns that have drained us, right? And fixing that problem in one session doesn't occur. This is where the counselor's role of understanding the problem and giving tools to people help out a lot. And in the end, it's not fixing the problem, but finding what? Resolution. Very good. You guys are learning. Any questions about that so far? Any questions? Okay. Um, in mental, I mean, in uh, counseling, there's different types of counselors too. And the reason why I'm doing this is just to educate you guys about, uh, and we have stereotypes about what, what kind of counseling or counselors there are. Uh, the first type, have you guys heard of these? Psychiatrists? Uh, anybody have a picture of this in mind? What do you think about psychiatrists? Sitting on the couch. Oh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> Sitting on the couch. Sitting on the couch? Good. But to be honest with you, this is not the way it is. This is just basically a doctor in his uh, coat that sits behind the desk and basically writes down prescriptions. And sometimes they do therapy, sometimes they don't. So these are good for who? Would you think this would be good? Mental health disorder, uh, any kind of mental health disorder, or if there's any other uh, biological. biological problems, very good. And uh, they do assessments, testings, and sometimes they do counseling. Uh, but their major role is what prescription. So this is something that um, professionals who go through counseling are able to refer someone to a psychiatrist. Okay. We have any nurses here? And one and two. So um, this is the psychiatric uh, uh, advanced practice nurse. These are the ones that have master's degrees in nursing. And this also, these individuals do mental health as well. They help with patients who are uh, psychotic and other other problems like that. And uh, they kind of do the uh, people that go to institutions and stuff like that. They work with them. And uh, hopefully I won't have to refer you guys to them, right? Okay. And then the psychologist. You guys hear this a lot, right? Psychologist. Everyone thinks a counselor is a psychologist, but no. A psychologist is a little bit different. It's a master's or doctorate degree uh, person with counseling or medical counseling. And they can be licensed. And this is the other problem. They always, there's a doctor in front of you, right? There's a doctor something. Right? Unfortunately, they're not medical doctors, so they can't prescribe you medication. It depends on the state you're licensed. It does. Okay. Yes. Um, it, um, I'm not sure which state it is. Not California. California. Okay. Okay. Staying with the hemp or marijuana. Licensed clinical social worker. Uh, do we have any social workers here? 
these are people that completed their master's degree or even uh, their uh, graduated their bachelor's degree as well in uh, social work. And this is one thing uh, I just kind of got thrown into the social work aspect through my uh, working with uh, child uh, services. And it's awesome what social workers do. They're so like abused in the process because when there's problems, they're the ones that people go to and they're the ones that get all the heated emotions from people. But what amazing thing they do is they network. They give you resources. This is something that counselors always love to do is give you resources and provide you with help in the end. And then this is where I kind of fall into. Um, this is both non-licensed and also licensed counselors as well. Uh, these folks have bachelor's degree, master's degree in counseling, social work, like that last one, pastoral counseling. Uh, addiction counselors, um, all these other things. And each state will be different when it comes to this as well. Uh, you, have to do, you have to be board certified in some states, and sometimes you don't have to be board certified. But it's amazing what these people do. And not saying because I, you know, my background is this, but this is the ones that get their hands dirty the most. These are the ones that do the counseling. These are the ones that meet with the people and also try to find um, the problems for each person. And uh, one thing I, uh, I like about this aspect is that um, who likes to draw here? And when you start a drawing, what do you do? Do you, you have a picture or something that you want, Frank? I just need a lot of paper. You <laughs> <laughs> a lot of paper, yeah, that's true. And I think when it comes to counseling, it's almost like an artwork where each stroke has an effect on the person. Is it good or bad? You can crumble up the paper, right? I like that. It's very good. But then when you're ready to paint it, what happens? It's beautiful, right? In your own vision, right? It's beautiful. And art is so unique in that way because what? Art is one of those things where it's a visual sense. Not everyone's going to appreciate the art like someone else, right? But for that person, that artwork is so meaningful. And that's the same thing with counseling and, it, and uh, therapy as well. It's kind of that artwork of therapy. Uh, it's amazing how it works out. I can't explain it. It just does. And part of that is by going through that processes that I mentioned, okay? Now here it goes. This is a big thing. Welcome to our movement in this direction. This is not something that just happened. Uh, it's just something that's been meaning to happen for a while. And it's a process. We're still in the, fortunately, it's been almost two years since we started this. We're still in the infancy part of this. It's, it's sad on our part. Uh, by the grace uh, of God, um, the Southwest Diocese, uh, our beloved uh, Xavier Sereni has established the Department of Counseling for our church. And um, being a part of this, does anybody know uh, John from Dallas here? Yes, <laughs> some of you guys. But he's the director of uh, the counseling. He is a professional counselor. He's a licensed uh, family and marriage uh, therapist. And I am the assistant director to the Department of Counseling. And the reason why I bring this up is everything that we talked about needs to be implemented here in this counseling department. And we're going to have a question and answer session, hopefully, in a little bit. Um, I want to have your perspective brought into this as well. But before we do that, uh, this is the thing. I've been in ministry for almost 13 years. And through those 13 years, I've experienced different types of need for this counseling. And it starts, especially like I mentioned, with uh, the mental health and also abusiveness and also uh, our own uh, difficulties that we face, even within our church. You know, There's a lot of struggles that come along. Uh, one thing that I mentioned to you guys, um, you know, people in America, uh, there's been a study, 
that about 18% of people um, who are in college in uh, postgraduate studies go through depression. But at the same time, there's younger kids that also go through depression. And I don't know if you guys know about this. Have you guys heard about bullying? Have you heard that perspective? And uh, kids are attempting suicide because of this. And this is something I think Focus Nation also needs to look in as being mentors for the kids. To open up their hearts to see that there's problems in our kids. And not just suicide, but if you pull up the sleeves of young girls, do you know what you see? Cutting marks. And these are signs of beginning stages of what? Suicide. Because part of the reason why they're cutting, you know why they're cutting? Attention. But if you're in a home where you're told you're nothing and you're meaningless, what happens to your emotions? You have no emotions. So the way that they feel, they feel pain. Yeah. And this is reality in our church. This is reality in our community. And we need to focus our attention on these things. And the problem with depression as well, like I mentioned, if you don't take care of depression, if you try to hide depression in your life, you know, down the road, you have physical ailments. You know, um, one thing they say, uh, depression also affects both our physical. So diabetes occurs, health problems occur, high blood pressure occurs. And all this affects our heart, right? To the point where our heart stops, technically. And part of that problem is that we need to find a way to resolve these issues. And then kind of going back, um, and if, if the depression is not taken care of as well, uh, it leads to other mental health. Like I mentioned, does everybody know what bipolar is? Yeah. Everyone knows what bipolar is, right? It's where your mood swings completely within a few days. One person can be really happy one day, and then be really, really sad, depressed, to the point where they will commit suicide. And I had the opportunity to work with somebody who did this, and this is in our Malali community, where this mother of 68 years old uh, had gone through so many difficulties in her life, and you know what our community told her to do? She was on medication prescribed by her psychiatrist. You know what her community told her? Stop taking it. And then about a month ago, she took 16 sleeping pills because she couldn't take it anymore. That's what we're teaching. That's what we're telling people. Not to take care of your bodies, not to take care of yourself, but what? Just give up. Ignore it. Become one of those statistics. Instead of finding resolution, we're trying to find uh, ways to resolve it, and we can. And one way we can do that is by going through the counseling process. And not giving you bad news. This is not everything counselors do. Not giving you bad news. We bring you good news too. Trust me. And uh, for those that. Uh, are going to get married, we're doing premarital counseling. Um, we have, for my account, premarital counseling session, we have um, seven sessions. They're hour long sessions. I have someone who just started here. So, um, and each hour we have uh, different uh, aspects that we look at. We look at the family, we also look at the spiritual aspect of all. Of course, we have to do that when it comes to church related activities. And then also, um, the individual, the couple. Something that we forget about is that everyone is different, right? Everyone is so different. And when it comes to marriage, this is the prime example of this. When even scripture says this too, right? We come from two different families, but the two will become one flesh, right? The wife will leave her family and join her husband, right? That's a husband's family too, right? And in that perspective, there's so many things that are good when it comes to that kind of counseling. Because what happens? When you open up the line of communication, what happens? 
things are brought up, things are resolved, right? And one unique thing is, um, how many of you guys have disagreements with family members all the time? Not to raise your hands, but we all do, right? And uh, how do you guys usually communicate with your family? Well, <laughs> is it by phone sometimes? Oh, you mean that one? Someone that comes to you with the, you know, the same, oh, I have a discipline. That's 
setup of things is one of the fish that's so long. Huh? Uh, and, uh, how do you kind of not necessarily lead them to, or, or how do you help them seek help? Um, what they say they're going to hurt themselves? Yeah. This is, um, I think this is going to be, this is a touchy subject right there. Um, the best answer would be, do you feel like they're going to hurt themselves immediately, or, or do they say that they have a plan to do anything like that? Or no, this, this, is an this example? Like if they're, this is the thing, um, this is where professionals come in. I would recommend to call 911. If they make a threat to you, call 911. That's the best thing. Because what will happen is um, they'll have to be seen by a professional, and that professional by that. And I've had, to, I've had to call 911 on someone too. So this is what happens. So for you guys that haven't been through this process, the police will come. They'll take this person, and they go under their custody. So you can't talk to them. If you go to the hospital, you can't even be near them. They go, and they're basically the property of the police. So what the police will do is they'll make sure they're stabilized, if they're, if they're thinking about doing anything. Then they'll be taken to a mental health facility. And there they'll be evaluated. That's the only way. I mean, not, well, not whatever, but that's from my own experience. Like, you have to take that initiative. Uh, if they're seeing somebody professionally, letting the professional know will be the next thing. But if you know someone's really going to do it, that's, that's my own personal opinion. Okay, now let's look at a different perspective about counseling, okay? Can you guys see this? Do you guys notice anything there? Or do you see anything? Just take a few moments just to look at it. Yes, it knows it. <laughs> no, 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 no. You guys notice anything? Huh? You guys see it? I know it's kind of a, I can't get it so hot. You guys see dots, right? Somewhere? Somewhere? Did everybody see it? Or some of you can't, right? Don't worry. The lower layer. <laughs> oh, it's, it's because of the, oh, the projector, sorry. <laughs> so not really <laughs> very good eye, very good eye though. Okay, try to keep the light, see if you can see it better. You guys see it? Oh. No? It's like there's like, like lines moving in there. It's moving? There's like little like gray lines moving now? This is yeah, like, like, if you have sway like this, there's like lines. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, can you turn the light? Alright, did you guys notice that there were little dots here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here, here, and here. Did you guys notice that? Is there dots there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. There is? Yes. Now that I mention it? Well, literally, there's nothing there, guys. There's nothing there at all. And this is what I'm talking about when it comes to our mind. Perception. It's so messed up sometimes. Because when you live in a world, especially this world, it becomes so skewed to the point where you're seeing things that someone else will not see. And this is the problem, is that I can't tell you what you see. That's not what a counselor does. The counselor will say, okay, you see the dots, then what are we going to do with those dots, you know? And part of this mental illness, it's not a bad thing. The thing with mental illness is um, there's an issue within yourself that needs to be corrected. So, um, go back to this. And this is where I think counseling itself plays that big role in our life. Because we have to be taking out, taking ourselves out of the norm. And this is the thing, I think even in our Bali culture, we're thinking inside of this box, right? We have this box. Our life has to be this. Once you turn 25, you have to get married, right? Once you pass that age, you're not, you're not good enough for anyone, right? That's not true. When you have those things, that's not what it means. Life is not about this. Uh, limitation. Life is about experiencing life in the way that God has intended for you. But it's different for everyone. And counseling gives you the perspective to live that life, to open up your heart, to enjoy who you are. And our church sometimes hates who you are. I'm sorry to say this. Our, I know I had an individual who came to my church, and his mother came to me, right? She's like, 
oh, uh, oh, Chamacha, I was like, oh, Chamacha, you need to talk to my son. He's not coming to church anymore, right? I was like, okay, I can talk to him. Not a big problem. And uh, he's like, she's like, oh, yeah, he's not coming to church anymore. And uh, I was talking to him. And uh, he was kind of into the modern fashion and everything. So he grew out his hair, right? And he grew out his hair to the point where his mom told him on Sunday, don't come to church. Right? His mom basically said, don't come to church. And he continued to grow his hair. He grew it pretty long, too. And his mom wants me to talk to him, to tell him to come to church, but she's basically built up the barrier herself. So, and I've had this problem with some of my uh, couples that I've talked to. You know, when I go through the premarital counseling, we talk about in-laws. <laughs> you know, in-laws cause a lot of the problem with our marriages even our own families, parents in general. And I wish that our parents could also go through the premarital counseling with the couples themselves. Because some of the things that we talk about, I'm not saying I'm trying to blame them, but just the way that we've, they've been raised, the way that they, they uh, live, it would benefit them to be a part of this because we kind of resolve some of these issues that we have. Because we're trying to live that life, you know, that imperfect life, so that we can live in a way to perfect it, to have that relationship. Because part of the problem is when we have that relationship, uh, when it's not good, it kills us. And so working through this process and going through that helps us a lot. John, what's on time? Uh, it's over. It's over? Oh, man. I want to do, uh, sorry, I want to do this real quick. Go ahead. Um, we do it for a move on. Um, okay. I wanted to open up for questions for, for you guys. Do you have any questions? I know we talked a lot, and uh, part of the reason why I want to do this is kind of inform you guys that it's not bad. It's not something that's bad. It's something that's going to be productive for yourself. Any questions, concerns? How um, would you probably approach somebody that might be hesitant about counseling? Like, I know a lot of parent, people feel like they should, like, they want to go with their parents to work on problems, but uh, our parents are obviously very hesitant about going to counseling. Speaking of that, I had an individual, she was sexually abused, and um, one of our own kids, and she told her parents right away, and parents didn't believe her, said it never happened. And again, for, uh, trying to force somebody, I worked in a, a system where we force people to go to counseling, and it's not good unless that person is willing to go to do the counseling. Because we can't force someone to sit there and go through it. The problem is, we're talking about those un like uncomfortable uh, topics. These are topics that nobody wants to talk about. We don't even want to express it here. You know? It's so, it doesn't feel good. So getting someone to go there, it's going to be a challenge for that individual. And this is where I think focus also can play a role is experiencing counseling for yourself. So for those that haven't gone through it, just to go through that process and to let people know, you know what, they're not out to uh, kind of uh, put a stereotype on you, but they're out to kind of help you. So slowly opening up our community to this. And remember how we talked about we can't change anyone or we can't change someone else? That's the problem. We don't want to change them. We want to them to accept the fact that there is a problem. So. It's an ongoing process, so pray for the person as well to try to give them the push in the right direction. And if their parents don't go, I would recommend the individual to go to get at least help for them. How do you deal with all the problems you hear? How do you deal with it yourself? Because like you're hearing it, it's like we're depressing. You know, I was working with CPS for almost five years now, and I'm going to tell you this. I had a coworker who was a police officer. Uh, this past February, she made some mistake. So, is that? Okay. Uh, what happened was uh, she pretended like there's nothing wrong. And I remember we worked a lot of cases together. You could never tell there's nothing wrong. But uh, finally, the stress with that job sexual abuse like no other. These are guys that are having sex with their six-month-old child. 
these are people who are abusing their wives to the point where they're killing them. And there's like children that are being physically abused to the part where they're paralyzed. You know, when you're taking that in, it does, it does take a toll on the physical. To be honest with you, I just talked to a senior about this too. You know, it's my faith that's helped me a lot. And I've had friends and also counselors. You know, I couldn't do it with one or the other. I needed both of them to help me. Because to be honest with you, I could have put that one to myself too. To be honest with you, I could have pulled the trigger on myself. Because they I wanted to do that. Because the other thing that's where Satan also plays a role is something that you need that spiritual aspect and you also need the mental help to help your students. Make sense? I hope you guys, uh, I mean, you guys, if you have questions, we can always finish this up on in, in the breaks and everything else. But uh, if you guys can, uh, just go ahead and write down my uh, contact information as well because I would love to hear your perspective. Because I don't, the thing is, I don't like titles. I'm, I'm a person that hates titles. So I don't care uh, about just being an assistant, but I want to make this a flourishing uh, department. So I want this, uh, in a sense, to get your feedback and also um, tell me ways to kind of, or needs that we need to uh, present. Because there's a lot of problems out there, so. Sorry. Um, so if you guys can give me perspectives, go ahead and write down. Uh, my cell phone number is uh, 210. 687-6192. And then um, my email is M-A-T-H-E-W-Z, Z and Zebra, dot B-I-N-U at gmail.com. Did you guys get it? Okay. M-A-T-H-E-W-Z dot B-I-N-U at gmail.com. You guys have any questions before we end? So does the rest of the department do you have a website for this counseling department? Can you help? Yes. <laughs> any volunteers? <laughs> we, were, we had a brochure, but uh, what happened is uh, my work computer crashed and I had to submit it back, so um, all the information was lost. So I, I could use all the help. So. I'm always looking also for professionals with the same background as well, too. So anyone interested, come and talk to us. We, we need out um, resources in every location. So I need to know who's willing to go into that direction as well, too. And it doesn't have to be a priest. I don't believe the priest. This is not a role that priests need to be in as well. And I do a lot with my own uh, people that come to me. Um, I don't. I can't be your counselor. So if you guys come to me, I will not be your counselor, to be honest with you. Because I have a relationship, and unfortunately, I'm going to use this um, quote, I can't wear multiple hats. <laughs> I can only wear one hat. And I, I can't be two different people. So when it comes to certain things, I will give you better people. Make sense? Any questions, concerns? All right, let's start. Right, we're ready. We're ready. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for gathering us together in this session. As we've gone through this, very delicate subject, oh Lord. Thank you for all those who have gathered here and also opened up their minds to realize that there is a great need for us and our church to also flourish in this world, especially the outlet of counseling and also in our own personal lives, but that they are able to serve you even through their perfections, to come closer to you, to become whole in your holy name. Oh Lord, in your precious name, we pray now and always and forever and ever. Amen.